Hello friends, it's me, Kit. When I'm not out fighting crime, I like to follow my friends at nightriderhistorians.com. Check it out. Hey guys, it's Joe. Um, about a week ago, we put a post on the Night Rider Historians Facebook page asking you guys to submit your questions to us. You know, anything related to Night Rider, uh, to the cars, the behind the scenes, whatnot. And um, we got a ton of responses. So I printed out, uh, I don't know, 15 or so questions. So I thought, let's just go through them. And, you know, if this is something you guys like, maybe um, we can do it, you know, every couple weeks, couple months to get AJ uh, to answer some questions and whatnot. So um, we'll do our best. Obviously, um, neither AJ nor I were actually um, there on the set, but uh, through all of our um, interviews and the research we've done, uh, we pretty much feel like we were on the set. So um, without further ado, let's answer your questions. So, and I'm apologize in advance. I know I'm going to screw up some of uh, your names, the pronunciation, but I'll do my best. So question one is from John Saberis. Can you disclose what episodes your screen use kits were used in? So um, as you know, we have two of the five surviving screen use Knight Rider cars. Um, one of those cars was used in all four seasons, and that's the car that's currently at the Peterson Museum in Los Angeles. It was one of the original uh, three cars procured for uh, the pilot presentation that Glenn Larson uh, put together to sell the series to uh, NBC. Uh, so that car was used, um, it was using the opening, the filming of the opening intro. Actually, the first few seconds when you see Kit racing towards you uh, in the desert, uh, right as it comes under uh, the camera, that that scene is one of our two cars. And then whenever you see the close-up, it's actually a different car. Um, and that car was used throughout all four seasons. Uh, it was heavily used in the first season, not as the hero car, but as... Um, like a backup to the hero car. So it had a dash in there. The dash had stickers on it instead of um, electronics. It didn't have switch pods. The steering wheel would switch. Sometimes it has a gall wing. Sometimes it had um, a round stunt wheel. Um, if you look at deadly maneuvers, you'll see there's some scenes, especially towards the climax of the episode where Kit has like a dragster style wheel. That's our car. Um, so the first season, it was it was used pretty much in every episode, but um, kind of as a backup. And then the second season, it became the insert car. So the insert car is the one that's used whenever they're filming uh, inside of Kit while the car's being towed. So for the second season only, it was an insert car. And then from there, uh, it... Um, in Speed Demons, it was one of two cars that was outfitted with the high traction, high traction drop downs. So it still has a lot of that equipment. It's not functional. Um, and then by the third season, they used it much, much less frequently. Um, it was the car that was buried in the sand in Kit First Car. And if you notice, whenever they pull that car out and start driving away, it has the high traction drop downs up. That's because they were using it in the sand and they needed more traction, I suppose. But um, that's our car, and then it kind of fades off from there. It's used here and there throughout the next two seasons. Um, I think one of its last appearances, if I remember correctly, is in Hills of Fire, the climax where the, um, the pickup truck that shoots flames does the roll. It flips over Kit. That's actually our car, and if you pause it right at that scene, you can see the high traction drop downs are up. Um, so that was one car. And then the other car we have, um, the one that was on Jay Leno's garage and on Good Morning America last year, that was just kind of a general purpose stunt car. And it first appeared in Night Strike in season three. Um, and just by, I don't know if it's by coincidence or whatnot, but the scene in Night Strike where the explosions are going off on either side of Kit while they're shooting the lasers at him, uh, it ended up in the fourth season um, intro which is kind of cool. That's our, our uh, other car. And that car was used uh, in 12 episodes. So it was Night Strike and then 11 more episodes in the fourth season. Um, so yeah, okay. So that's... 
All right, question two, Phil Braithwaite. Like to know more about Super Pursuit Mode. How did they come up with the idea? Um, I'm not sure that I, I could probably make up an answer, but I know by the fourth season, um, you know, they were trying to come up with something new, something exciting. Ratings were dipping a little bit. And I don't know who, um, where the genesis of that idea came from necessarily, but, uh, you know, some people love it, some people hate it, but, um, and obviously you had people like Jay Orberg, George Barris, Dennis Braid, um, they were the ones responsible for, uh, getting that super pursuit mo car and the convertible car, uh, built and constructed, uh, with, they only had a couple months to do it too, but, um, you know, some people like it, some don't. Okay, the next question comes from Knight Rider Polska. Hi guys, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Did you ever see the Polish version of Knight Rider? Um, and could you confirm one thing, how many kit cars were used on the show? Um, no, we haven't seen the Polish version, but now you have me curious, so I think that's the next thing we'll do. Um, how many kit cars were used on the show? Oh, um, this is a tricky one because... Um, you know, you talk to people that were there and actually worked on the show, uh, namely like Jack Gill. And he says they went through, um, I don't know, 30 or 40, I think I saw him say. And they very well could have. Um, you know, for us, there's a few things that we can go by. First, we can go by, obviously, the cars that have survived. Um, we can also go by um, certain... Uh, things on the cars you know when you watch the show and especially if you watch it in the order it was produced not the order that it aired because it's two different uh orders um and if you start watching the show specifically to watch the cars you can start to see you can start to tell which car is which and um you know when the cars quit showing up it's kind of like a fingerprint. No two of those cars were ever the same. So um, a couple years ago, we did that. And we took uh, way too long, a long, long time. And we went through the show in production order. And we specifically m watched it for the cars, marked out each individual iteration of the car. From what we can tell, it appears that there were roughly 20 cars that were ever used on the show. Um, we could be way off. There could be, you know, 30 or 40. But um, as far as we can tell, tr the number we're sticking with is 20. Um, Universal Studios, some of you know this, they, they numbered the cars. They had hidden numbers on them in certain places. And um, the production call sheets that were used, um, they were given out to the actors to be on set. They also ha they had the cars listed on those sheets. So um, by their, their inventory numbers. So we have a number of these call sheets as well. So we also use those inventory numbers and we've been able to match what we see on screen to the actual car numbers. And that also kind of reinforces that um, about 20 cars were used. However, we recently discovered uh, in some of our research that when a certain car was destroyed, they brought in a replacement car and they gave it the same number. So that makes it really difficult uh, to determine the exact number. But we say about 20, could be a lot more, definitely not less. Okay. Um, Adrian Jono. I was wondering if you knew what happened to the screen used comlinks. Um, unfortunately, no, uh, we don't know what happened to them. Uh, my guess is they went back to the Universal Studios prop department. Uh, perhaps one of the prop guys that worked on the show um, has one as a souvenir, but so far, none that we've been able to verify as original have ever popped up. All right, Peter McLaughlin Wortley. Why were the blind driver kit car seats so much taller in season four than in other seasons? You know, that's one of those things I, I guess I realized, but I never really thought about. Um, specifically, you know, if I think about it in season four, the seats were higher up 
uh, especially the right-hand blind drive car. There was a left-hand blind drive car and a right-hand blind drive car. Um, my guess is they probably had to modify the seats a little bit or the way that they bolted into the car just so um, different stunt people could fit into the seat without you noticing as much. Um, normally it was Jack Gill blind driving, but by the fourth season, I think they had a couple other people too. So maybe they had to alter it to allow the different stunt guys and their different sizes to fit in there because uh, we recreated a blind drive seat a number of years ago and it's really, really, really tight to get into. So that would be our guess. They just had to modify it for some other stunt guys. Our buddy, Nick Nugent. Of all the Knight Rider based versions of kit that have ever been released over the years, which one is your favorite? Well, the original, of course, Nick. You can't go with anything but the original. And what do you consider to be the most series accurate? Well, any that were in the series are series accurate. So whether you're talking like two TV or one TV, that's all accurate. Um, but you know, you can't beat the original. And Nick had a follow-up question. Approximately how many times does Glenn A. Larson's name come up in the opening and closing credits of the series? Teehee. Well, Nick, we did a little um, math prior to this video and the answer is about 253. So um, in the pilot, he was the writer. So his name was there. He was listed as ex executive producer for 84 episodes. He was listed um, with Stu Phillips as uh, creating the main theme at the end credits for 84 episodes. And he had the Glenn A. Larson title card at the end of 84 episodes. So that comes out to 253. You can let me know if I'm wrong. Michael Howe, the C button, great or totally unnecessary? Really, if you think about it, weren't all of Kit's buttons totally unnecessary? I mean, couldn't he just use voice, couldn't Michael use voice command to say whatever he needed? So really, if you say the C button is unnecessary, aren't all buttons unnecessary? That's my response. Um, Tony Lima. Uh, there's a lot of information. Um, did they ever use stick shift cars in the show? And did they use crossfire injection cars or swap them for carb 305 or 350? So um, they did have at least one stick shift car. Um, it was one of their stunt cars. And actually, if you look at Junkyard Dog, the car that gets put into the acid pit is used to be a uh, manual transmission car. So take a look whenever they pull the car out and the camera pans into the guts, the inside of the car, you'll be able to see that there's um, a clutch pedal and the, there's also um, a cutout for the manual transmission in the, in the drivetrain channel, tunnel. Um, so there's definitely that one. I don't think there were many more. There, there might've been one or two, but for the most part, they were all automatics. The stunt guys preferred the automatics. Um, and they did have, a crossfire car, at least one. Um, we see it, you know, the the parts being pulled off in Goliath. But um, really, you know, by that point in the series, they they kind of were whatever cars they got are the cars that they got. Um, you've all heard, I'm sure, of the the train derailment incident, uh, which we'll cover in a future video in great detail. But um, the cars they got from that, I mean, if some of them were manual, manual transmission, if some were crossfire, I mean, they got what they got because they were given to them and they were made to work with it. Um, but the majority of the cars were carb, four barrel carb, the, the factory quadrajet. And most of the cars had their factory 305s in them. Um, our two original cars still have their numbers matching engine blocks in them. Not transmissions, but engine blocks. Um, so Jack Gill says that uh, they did uh, mod a couple of the cars with, or at least one car with a 350. One, I think even had nitrous in it, but um, those cars don't survive anymore. So out of the five originals, um, four of them have 305s and one of them is a V6. And all of the, well, I shouldn't say all the transmissions, but uh, most of the transmissions were swapped out for turbo 350, three speed automatic. All right, Adrian Roman. 
what engine are used in AJ and Joe's cars? Okay, I guess I just answered that. So uh, for both of our cars, it's the factory 305 with four barrel quadrajet. Um, actually, the just as a side note to provide a little more value to this question, um, they removed all of the computers out of the cars. So when they did that, they had to swap out the computer controlled quadrajet and the computer controlled distributor for a vacuum advanced distributor and just a, um, a non computer controlled quadrajet. So those pieces in our cars are actually from late seventies GM vehicles, probably spare parts that the transportation department had laying around whenever they, you know, retrofitted these cars. Um, second part of Adrian's question. Um, he saw that in one of our videos for one of our screen use cars, we had a relay board in the trunk. What is that for? Um, actually it's a multi-part question. So to answer that first one, the relay board was installed after the show ended whenever the car was being put on display um, at the World Expo 88 in Brisbane, Australia. That was the relay panel that would control all the car's functions. So they, um, they hacked up all the car's wiring and they made it so the headlights, the windows, um, the trunk popper can all be um, controlled remotely from an off state kind of an off stage thing so um the relays were just part of the system that controlled all of the car's functions uh it's no longer functional we restored the car's functions back to the way that they were when it was used on the show um but we kept the relay panel in for the history of it um are there original trans am clocks under the dashboard i think you mean ugh, the speedometer the gauges so um out of all of the surviving cars, there are there are three that have speedometers in them. Um, R2 and then the convertible still does. The other two do not. Um, what's the approximate, approximate mileage of your cars? So um, the one car that I talked about earlier that was used in all four seasons, one of the original three cars has about 2,200 original miles. And then our other car that was brought in for Night Strike and was used throughout the fourth season has about 500 original miles on it. And we don't drive them on the road, so the mileage doesn't really change. Um, let's see, Jim Cavanaugh, and all, yeah, Jim Cavanaugh says, whatever happened to the semi that was used on the series? I am going to keep you in suspense. Well, I'll, I'll give you a little bit. So um, there were actually two semis used on the show. There was one used in the first two seasons and then one used in the second, the last two seasons. So whenever you see the semi change for when it had the sleep, the fake sleeper cab, that's actually a completely different GMC General. Um, we do have the VIN numbers of both of those semis. The second one from the third and fourth season, um, we have found it still exists. The first one we have not found yet. Um, and the trailer is, to be, we haven't found that yet either. So we do know at least that the second semi still exists. Sebastian Nee, is there any raw film material left of the series? The answer is probably, but we don't really have it. Um, Universal Archives would most likely have anything like that. Um, be great to get our hands on it though. Federico Benzuela III, where the sounds of kits a regular V8 or added during post-production. They were mostly always added during post-production. There's a few times in the series where you can hear um, Kit's real engine. The one that comes to mind is in Mouth of, Sna Mouth of the Snake whenever they're in the, um, the surplus yard and Kit comes roaring around the corner and flying past the camera. Um, you can hear that that's the roar of the V8 engine of the, the actual car. They didn't add that in. Jacob Peterson. Um, where were the SPM and EBS loca buttons located in the season four dash? Well, the answer is nowhere. Um, in reality, they were on a stage and they were just mounted on a board, you know, separate from the dash itself. Um, so really they were never, they were never in the car. They were never even on this, the insert dash that sat on the stage. Um, if I had to place them somewhere, I would place them approximately where the radio goes in a, and a stock Trans Am. And why all the miniatures in the second season? Um, mainly because they were trying to save some money and they brought in Jack Sessoms 
and uh, Sesams and Slagle was the name of the production company. And they had done work on Dukes of Hazard and Fall Guy and all these other shows. And they brought them in to um, do the miniature work starting about second season. And then um, they did it all the way through the end of the series, but it got less and less. They, were, they started doing more real stunts again. Stuart McLaughlin, what happened to Michael Long's Trans Am that was left in the desert? Um, so I'm assuming you're talking about production-wise, not like canon-wise. Um, so production-wise, that just became one of the other kit cars. So uh, that became the fourth kit car that was um, used throughout the first season uh, before they started getting multiple. They only had um, they only had three cars to shoot the pilot presentation. They got a fourth car between the pilot presentation and when they filmed the rest of the pilot. And then they had four cars up through, um, I think it was give, give Me Liberty or Give Me Death. Yeah, that's when they got a fifth car. And then in Whitebird, they got a sixth car. And then the train derailment happened towards the end of the first season. So by the second season, they had a whole bunch of cars. Um, Simon, Mick, I'm not even going to pronounce your last name, Simon M. I'd like to know if the season one, two stage dash still exists. I can't say for certain. My gut is yes, it probably does exist. We have a pretty good idea of who has it, but we haven't confirmed it yet. So if we ever do confirm it and if we're allowed, we will let you know. Um, Andy Coyle, do any of the cars exist? Night Automated Roving Robot, not CAR. Um, so car was just kit repainted you know they had multiple multiple trans ams they just used a second trans am so um to answer your question yes out of the cars that were used as a car two of them still exist two out of the five surviving cars were car k-a-r-r -R, in the series the one we have and one of the other um, five originals um, neither one of the two that survived were um ever painted the with the silver accent they were both the car they were both car before he was painted so car with the silver accent none of those cars still exist adrian roman another question what is the year of production for both of your cars do you have any clues of the vin um the two that we have are one's an 82 one's an 84. um out of the five surviving originals, they're all 82s except for the 84 that we have. And yeah, we know the VINs of all five that survived and the VINs of a number of the ones that didn't survive as well. Um, it's true that they removed the VIN tags, not on all of the cars. That's a whole nother story that we're not going to get into. But some of the VIN tags on the original cars are still there. Um, but... Uh, even with those tags gone, you can still figure out what the VIN is of the car through other means. There's other markings on the car. There's um, pieces of the VIN stamped in different body parts hidden all throughout the car. So yeah, we know the VINs of all the cars. And the last question from James Sleeth, where were the green lenses on the steering wheel going to, what were the green lenses going to be used for on the steering wheel for season three and four? So uh, based on what Michael Chaffee has told us and shown us um, with some of his concept drawings that we see, you know, anytime we, he does a presentation in person, they're not available online. Um, his original drawings were for those flip up caps to be like, um, like a trigger. So you know how they have switches that you pull the safety up and then the switch is underneath and you switch it. That's what those were meant to be for. There was meant to be meant to be like a, I think, I think, if I remember correctly, it was meant to be the new turbo boost. So he would flip the cap up and hit the button underneath and that would be the new turbo boost. And originally those green um, lenses were red in the concept drawings. So, um, but by the time it got into production, it was nothing more than, you know, an accent light on the steering wheel. So that concludes all of our questions for round one. So um, if you guys enjoyed this, uh, you know, let me know, we'll do it again. Uh, with the next round of questions and uh, be sure if you haven't already to um, share this video and like our Facebook page uh, check out our patreon and uh, we're gonna start uh, putting some exclusive content over there as well and um, I think that's it for now so uh, on behalf of myself and AJ we shall talk to you later thanks
And now, while we listen to Joe's selection of Knight Rider music that we received directly from Don Peak himself, we'd like to thank these Patreon supporters. Look at you guys scrolling up the screen to my right. Wait a minute, how can you tell which side is my right since you can't see me because I'm not on camera? Oh well, you know what I mean. We are featuring these fine supporters at our Knight Rider prop restorer level. Thank you very much for your support. And for those of you at the Knight Rider History Hunter level, we're recognizing you right now in the description. Now, if you enjoyed seeing this golden nugget of Knight Rider history being rescued from obscurity, then please consider supporting us on Patreon. Together, we've been researching Knight Rider history like this for over 25 years. And yes, it does take a lot of money and a lot of time to bring these things to you. And while we love doing it, your support would empower us to bring you even more of these historical nuggets and more often. We are the Knight Rider Historians. Till next time, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.